Okay, we're going to watch a, another video. This is a quick one. This is about how to make disruption happen. Um, yeah. So ladies and gentlemen, at TED we talk a lot about leadership and how to make a movement. So let's watch a movement happen, start to finish, in under three minutes and dissect some lessons from it. First, of course you know, a leader needs the guts to stand out and be ridiculed. <laughs> but what he's doing is so easy to follow. So here's his first follower with a crucial role. He's going to show everyone else how to follow. Now notice that the leader embraces him as an equal. So now it's not about the leader anymore, it's about them, plural. Now there he is calling to his friends. Now if you notice that the first follower is actually an underestimated form of leadership in itself. It takes guts to stand out like that. The first follower is what transforms a lone nut into a leader. <laughs> And here comes a second follower. Now it's not a lone nut, it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. So a movement must be public. It's important to show not just the leader, but the followers, because you find that new followers emulate the followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people and immediately after, three more people. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point. Now we've got a movement. <laughs> so, Notice that as more people join in, it's less risky. So those that were sitting on the fence before now have no reason not to. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, but they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. So, <laughs> over the next minute, you'll see all of the, uh, those that prefer to stick with the crowd because eventually they would be ridiculed for not joining in. And that's how you make a movement. But let's recap some lessons from this. So, first, if you are the type, like the shirtless dancing guy, that is standing alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals. So it's clearly about the movement, not you. <laughs> okay, but we might have missed the real lesson here. The biggest lesson, if you noticed, did you catch it? Is that leadership is over-glorified. That yes, it was the shirtless guy was first, and he'll get all the credit, but it was really the first follower that transformed the lone nut into a leader. So as we're told that we should all be leaders, that would be really ineffective. If you really care about starting a movement, have the courage to follow and show others how to follow. And when you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first one to stand up and join in. And what a perfect place to do that, Ted. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we can all do it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we're live. <laughs> all right. Next speaker. Um, Jeffrey Hosick has been working in the field of personal and corporate transformation for 25 years. He's dedicated himself to understanding the fullness of human darkness and potential. Himself a prison volunteer for 28 years, a volunteer firefighter, a business coach, therapist, and clergy. He seeks to see change follow through the, from the individual to the community, in nonprofits, and in the business sector. And I'm reading this because I've known Jeffrey forever, and I just don't want to miss it. Because <laughs> I could talk for an hour on Jeffrey. Jeff, Jeffrey holds a PhD in diversified counseling. He's an international author, speaker, trainer, and longtime friend. <laughs> My first question for you is, would you like to translate the world, or do you want to transform the world? Transform. Translating the world means you rearrange it so it feels comfortable. Transforming the world means you make it a different place altogether. To change the world, to transform the world, all you need is a spoon and five fingers. Do you, or, know someone that has a spoon and five fingers. Do we qualify? Yes. <laughs> Carlos Castaneda says, to make a change, you need to be ruthless without being harsh. 
You need to be cunning without being cruel. You need to be patient without being negligent. And you need to be sweet without being foolish. To be sweet without being foolish, you need a spoon and five fingers. Integral theory talks about the fact that the whole universe is made up of holons. And a holon is something that stands on its own, but can join with other things, other holons, to become something even better, become something different. Oxygen is an atom. And it's a whole lot because we know that oxygen requires is for everything that lives. We breathe it, plants breathe it, anything that's living includes oxygen. Oxygen can join with hydrogen and become compl something completely different. It's water. Think of the oceans and the rivers and the streams that we have. Completely different, but still the same. Sulfur is an atom. And when sulfur joins it with other it becomes an amino acid, which is very important for your muscles. Yet when sulfur and oxygen join together, it creates sulfur dioxide, which is a poison. Oxygen has the power of life, and oxygen has the power of death. Sulfur has the power of life, and sulfur has the power of death. People are holons, in the sense that they stand on their own as individuals. They join together in social holons to become groups. You can become a couple, become a family, become a community, become a town, become a province, become part of the country of Canada. You become part of the world. You can also become part of a gang, part of a crime ring, part of a destructive force. People have the power of life and people have the power of death. We are holons and we make that choice. The question is, to make the change, all you need is a spoon and five fingers. Do you want to translate the world and make it feel differently? Do you want to transform the world and make it a different place? The question is, how do you do both at the same time? Not translate and transform, but how do you change the group and change the individual? Because you have to have them both supporting each other to make a sustaining change. If you're a business leader, how do you change your employees so they're more productive or they're more fulfilled in their work and still maintain the purpose of the company? If you're a leader of a nonprofit or a church organization, how do you help your people grow and evolve and still develop your organization? And now for the five and the spoon. You can only put 5% on the spoon at any one time. People can't accept more than 5% change in any sitting. So it's not the size of the spoon, it's the size of what people can swallow that makes the difference. Have you ever tried to feed a baby? What happens if you put more in their mouth than what they can swallow? Either they won't take it, right? Or you get it all back in your face. <laughs> What happens if you are negotiating a contract with the employees of your company and you put in more than they can swallow? Either they won't take it or you get it all back in your face, right? People can't shift any more than 5% at any particular given time. When people start to choke on change, they change from a comfort zone to a survival instinct. And when they do that, we are in a completely different world. People transform from being nice, humble, sweet people to anxious, highly stressed units that are under threat. When we do that, we become defensive and aggressive like cornered rats. 5% be sweet without being foolish. One of my favorite therapists in the world was a nun who worked in a prison in Mission, British Columbia. Her name was Sister Marguerite, and she was the gentlest, most gracious counselor I ever met in my life. Her nickname was Sister Barracuda. <laughs> Barracudas, as you know, eat one bite at a time, and they're relentless in what they do. Sister Barracuda was so graceful and so sweet, she could take your ego apart piece by piece, and you'd feel blessed as she was doing it. 
Somehow you look forward to being reduced to rubble, you know? <laughs> she was sweet, but not foolish. She could make that change because when you signed on to change with her, she would come back bite after bite, five percent at a time, changing you until the job was done. And what was so cool about Sister Marguerite was that whatever energy that you gave her, you, gave, you got it all back plus interest. You are not only able to transform, but you're able to see the world a whole lot different. The really cool thing about gentleness is that it's diabolical. You can't defend against it. When a person is gentle and relentless, you can't stop it. Because gentleness is not about being passive. It's about taking an approach and being respectful and making a difference and keep coming back one bit at a time. Well, that's the theory. What about the application? Because after all, 5% for me is different for 5% for you. How do you do that? How do you make the change in your particular environment? One of the things we need to remember, this is not a science and it's not an art. It's a craft. You do it by skill and you have to learn the skill over a period of time. And the first person to start with, guess who? Yourself. And so when you begin, because you have to lead this particular change, you have to know what the territory is. And so you begin to make the change. But remember, be sweet without being foolish. The first thing we do is look in the mirror. We ask ourselves, what's there? Why do I really want this change? And who is going to change? What are the hidden motives that are there for me? What are the things I haven't yet seen that I want to do here? Is it my ego that's really pulling this? Is it my sense of unfairness? What's pushing me? That's the first question I need to ask myself. I need to start self-stalking so that I'm following myself around to see what it is I'm really doing and making sure that I'm pure and I'm clean on myself. I'm going after myself like in my own barracuda. <coughs> slowly taking one bite at a time. The second thing I need to do is earn the right to be heard. Everyone has a right to speak, but you have to earn the right to be heard, which means you need to develop your credibility in order to be able to pull the change off. And earning the right to be heard means we have to listen. And we first listen by listening to ourselves. So what exactly does it feel like to be foolish? And what does it feel like to be, to be silly? Or what does it feel like to push yourself beyond what you can do? 4% on the spoon looks like this. 5% looks like this. 6% looks like this. 7% looks like this. Do you know that boundary in yourself? Do you know when you reach all of those points? You can't lead change until you're able to read and respond and listen. Be sweet without being foolish. A spoon and five fingers. Or know someone that has a spoon and five fingers. So we meet someone at the door. One of the things I learned in therapist school was, the first thing you learn is, you're not your client. You're not your, ther you're not your patient. So there's a difference when I'm connecting with someone. I need to realize that what's going on in me may not be going on in you. The second thing we learn in therapy school is you are your client. You are your patient, which means that we share a humanity. When they're, what they're experiencing is within the whole realm of all human experience. And it's what I'm experiencing too. So the question I ask myself is, how do I move myself to the next level? How do I increase my competence and my confidence? Because as I'm about to lead change and disruption, I have to loan that to people who are making the change with me. How do I do that? How do I begin to develop that? Start believing in the people that you have around you. How do you help them come to the place where you know and you have a contract with them that you're going to take them to the next level? and you have the credibility, and you have the listening skills, and you have what it takes to move them to the next level, and they have confidence in you. You have confidence in them, and make that change. 
And what do you think they'll find at the top of the stairs at the next level? Success? No. They find anxiety up there. Because we're making a change and we're not used to it. So we'll find the chaos and we'll find confusion and we'll find people ready to sabotage what we're doing. The chaos comes because when we're in a new territory, we don't know what to think. We're on new ground. We don't understand any of it. It's about having confidence and competence and loaning that to people so they can stand in it until they see the chaos turn to order, until they see the confusion turn to clarity, until they know that they can change when the boundaries are being crossed because we know anxious people have bad boundaries and they will always do things to sabotage stuff. We get used to that and we recognize that that will be part of the territory and we'll do what we need to do in order to get through that. When we have led our group through that process and they're able to see how it's done and they're able to do it, they then start to teach someone else and they then begin to lead someone else through the change. And in the same way we encourage them to begin their process, we encourage them to self-stock, we encourage them to develop the credibility to loan to someone else and we slowly change the world with five fingers and a spoon. Be sweet without being foolish. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Amazing, thank you. Change and helping people around you change. <laughs>